and welcome. I think we're going to start the program for tonight before it gets too late. Um, I'm Christy Peterson. I'm a pr professor at the veterinary school of veterinary pathology, of all things. Um, and I am very happy to welcome Mr. Mike Shiley here tonight. Mike and I met almost exactly a year ago uh, down in Louisiana at Lamar Dixon. And he has traveled to some of the most crazy places in the world. Uh, Kosovo, the Middle East. He last year was touring with a film called Inside Iraq. He spent two different trips uh, over to Iraq where he faked a press pass, bought himself a um, flak jacket, and went behind the scenes and took footage in Iraq. Um, he also spent time in Kosovo and in Southeast Asia after the tsunami. He's made five different full-length films um, and Inside Iraq, the film that was showing last year, was selected to screen at 14 different film festivals and won Best Documentary three different times. So we're very pleased to have Mike here tonight showing Dark Water Rising. Um, it's taken, like I said, a year ago now, uh, about three weeks after the hurricane hit, and it shows the condition of animals and the people trying to rescue them during that time. So welcome, Mike Shiley. Thank you, thank you. I think I'm going to go this route. Um, okay, well, I'm Mike Shiley. I'm the producer and director of this film. And uh, can I just get a quick show of hands of who was here last night to see the screening of it? Okay, good, good. Uh, who here thinks this film is depressing and sad? Come on, you guys. I know you think this film is depressing and sad. Okay. You haven't seen it, but, but you, your perception is that it's depressing and sad, right? Okay. Um, well, that's a common uh, perception. And uh, now, who here is in the vet school or animal activist or fancy yourself an animal activist? Okay, good. Well, it's good that you guys are here because not only is this film about animals, it's also about politics, it's about current events, it's about history. It's about the, the deadliest hurricane in American history, and it's about the only major pet evacuation that has ever had to be run in the history of the United States, as far as uh, Dr. Peterson and I know. Now, I want to uh, clarify something for you guys. Um, Dr. Peterson and I, she says we met down in Louisiana, but we actually met in the bathroom, the ladies' bathroom, of a community college called Delgado Community College. And it must have been a very auspicious event because uh, not only did it lead to me being booked at Iowa State, which I'm happy to be here, but another person in our search and rescue party uh, met their future husband in the parking lot of, the, of this community college, and she's getting married in the parking lot, flying back down to New Orleans to get married there. So uh, this, this was an event that had a profound impact on, on a lot of us. So what we're going to do tonight is we started kind of late, so I'm going to get right into it. We're going to show uh, we're going to show about 20 minutes worth of clips from the film. Then I'm going to present, take some questions, and then if we have time, I'll show you about another 10 to 15 minutes worth of clips. So I'd like to thank the vet school at Iowa State and Pat Miller and the lectures department for bringing me in. Appreciate it, and uh, I look forward to showing you guys a good film. So um, if you guys are ready. We'll do it. Are you ready? Okay, let's do it. All right. If we can hit the lights and uh, push play, then we're ready to go. You want me to move this uh, podium? Can you see with the podium? Okay. All right. Well, you guys can move over here, too. Yeah, let's hit the lights, and then um, we'll go ahead and hit play. Thank you very much.
first thing that strikes you is this overwhelming stench, which is like nothing you've experienced before, and it burns your nostrils and your esophagus because it's chemicals and rotting garbage and mold and dead people floating in water and it smells like garbage and sewage and something burning, like burning chili peppers. When you see devastation on TV, you can only see what can be shown in 10 seconds. But when you're there experiencing it, you're so overwhelmed by the scope of it because it's block after block after block after block, an entire city. You can't imagine the devastation of an entire city.
stuff. Oh, sweet, yes. <laughs> Oh, you got him. You got him. Was there a snack? No, I thought it was. Oh, you got him. You got a puss. Small dog and a cat under the tub. All right. Let's stop. Then that from one second. Oh, you Hey, buddy. What's going on? I'm on here. Okay. I'm sorry, Doug. It's okay. It's okay. identification of bodies, but I don't plan to be a dead body. I just plan to maybe possibly be an unconscious one. Call it denial if you want, but that's where I'm at. Let's that's call, how, Let's call a spade a spade. No, that's how I'm getting through this. I had volunteered for FEMA and the Red Cross, but I wasn't doing the call and felt very helpless watching television and not being able to do anything about it. And I heard the Humane Society of the United States was asking for volunteers, so I decided to go. It's just an experience that not many people have the privilege of having. I know that sounds strange, but I really felt like it was a privilege to be there doing something and helping. We're actually doing really well. Most of them are sound asleep, which is crazy. We estimated about 50,000 pets were trapped in homes in New Orleans alone. And that doesn't speak to the surrounding parishes, doesn't speak to what's happening in Mississippi. It's a tremendously challenging effort. This is the greatest natural disaster ever to strike the United States, and animal victims are countless. We have rescued several thousand animals, but thousands more have died, thousands more have, have, uh, have not been attended to. It's an enormous logistical enterprise with thousands of volunteers since the beginning, hundreds at a time, with dozens of veterinarians, and really a makeshift shelter and staging area where we're operating from. The condition of the animals has deteriorated since the beginning of the, the rescue mission. Every week we've seen the animals' condition deteriorate. We have some animals who should have weighed 90 pounds that came in weighing at 39 pounds. We have had animals with sickness, with severe dehydration, but I'll tell you, three and a half weeks into this rescue mission, to find this many animals alive is astonishing to me. 
this little guy was the savior. When the crew went out in New Orleans to find the babies, they heard this one scream and bloody murder. They, she wanted to be found. These three little guys, the mom got scared off, and they brought them in to foster, be fostered by this kitty's mom. So there are two litters here being fostered by one cat. I've been working in the shelter for quite a bit of time, and only the experienced animal handlers were allowed to go do rescue. The shelter reaches capacity at 2,500 animals really quickly. We were shipping out as many as we could, but our strategy had to change to feeding and watering the animals in place, so people who are novices like me got to go out. And I saw them again about 10, 15 minutes ago, and I, I tried to call him over, and okay. he wouldn't call him over. Well, right now, we're not able to pick up any animals unless they're critical, because we just don't have any room in the shelter, and the vets and stuff are kind of low staff. So what we're doing is feeding and watering the place. Okay. So we can set up a feeding station for them and make a note of it. Our job was to go in and give food and water to animals whether they were on the streets or trapped in houses. They said, only bring in animals that are injured or somehow vulnerable. Of course it was very upsetting to everybody. You know, you just wanted to take them in, but when you start doing the math, it's overwhelming. We were told leave a week's worth of food and water. But let me tell you, if it's impossible there to leave a week's worth of water because it's over a 100 degree heat index. We write LASPCA, since they have the authority to be in this area, 925, which is the date, food and water, that there's a cat here or a dog here. And we do that so that the rescuers, when they come back in the future, will know to either pick up this cat if they've got room in the shelter or to drop food and water for it again. I've been in this neighborhood before and I just came back to kind of check on some of the animals that we dropped food and water for. Unfortunately, because of Rita, all the food and water that they had before is just completely rancid. There's flies covering everything. The task of resupplying them with food and water is a little bit overwhelming at this point and I don't know how to get them, to keep them from eating the gross stuff that's there. There's plenty of food and it looks like you can get to it, but it's kind of rancid. Yeah, that water's horrible looking. You gotta get any water for sure. I was really surprised by the number of pit bulls and Rottweilers. I would say half to two thirds of the dogs that we found in the neighborhood I was in were pit bulls. They'd be on these big heavy log chains with locks on them in the backyard. And they were aggressive dogs. They would, there were aggressive dogs there. The dog needs more biscuits, and the, well, I don't know why the dog can't get to this food. Well, maybe it's not in for enough. There's not. I'm a little shaky, to be honest with you. That this really did startle me, but I'm okay. Yeah. Yeah. Throw them in The first day that we came back into the city after Hurricane Rita was when we found this dog, this pit, black and white pit bull, so we named her Rita. Does my ass look big as these The situation with Rita was confusing because right next to her there was a small bowl of water and she was tied to a leash and it looked like somebody had been there, had tried to rescue her, had left some water and had taken off. In 
it made me sad to see her tied to a tree because her leash was so short. And I kept thinking, did she just survive Hurricane Rita? On this small leash, three feet long, did she survive this hurricane? Her leg was injured and was bleeding. She had an abscess and we thought at the time that she had a broken leg. So she was limping and her leg was in need of medical attention. She was a survivor. checked by a vet. This is an old scar you see. That's like, like it's something like this, like that. Some people have said she might have been fighting as a pit bull. There's a lot of pit bull fighting in New Orleans. The veterinarians checked out her leg and said there was another dog's tooth in her leg. She's been in a fight, that's for sure. <laughs> it was easy to speculate that a lot of dogs were being kept for fighting or for breeding purposes or for protection. Not Okay, we're going to take uh, a little uh, time for some Q&A, and then we're going to join up with the film uh, later on in the film towards the end of it. So, um, sorry, can you guys see or not? You can't, can yeah. you see it all? You can see it. Okay, cool. All right. Uh, so, if anybody has any questions, I'd love to take them uh, from this point up to the film. Um, yeah, anybody have any questions? Yeah, go for it. You were the one behind the camera on this? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, behind the camera. Yeah. How long were you down there? I was down there for three weeks, and Kim, the other rescuer, was down there for another two. And uh, we, um, I shot this film for about uh, $2,000, and so it's it's already paid for itself, uh, definitely. And uh, so, yeah. And it is the only uh, documentary film uh, that I know of, long-form documentary film, that's being produced about Hurricane Katrina animal rescues. And it's gotten into uh, four film festivals, and we just found out today that it uh, was chosen to be a part of the permanent Katrina exhibit at the Smithsonian Institute. So that's uh, pretty cool. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Thank you. Um, let me say, I can tell you more about Dr. Cap. No, I'm just kidding. Um, overall, in the region, there are over 600,000 animals. Uh, if, if you consider uh, Mississippi, Alabama, uh, Texas, Florida, the whole Katrina area was hit over 600,000. Uh, animals were uh, needing to be evacuation, which needed to be evacuated, which includes livestock, wild animals, uh, domestic pets, companion animals, that kind of thing. And so when you consider that probably around 80%, 80 to 90% of them died, uh, this was a real tragedy. And the problem was is that a combination of factors. Uh, number one, FEMA had a policy that if they were going to evacuate with them, that you could not take your pet with you. Uh, and because there was no pet plan in place, what that meant is that many people just left their animals in their house, uh, tied up to a chain or locked inside their house. Uh, some of them felt that they would be back in about three or four days like they are, uh, like it's happened with other hurricanes. And they had, you know, many of them had no idea that, that they would be gone, in some cases, up to eight months. And others just decided that, hey, my dog is like a piece of property, who cares, tie him up or let him go, and uh, let him fend for himself, which happened in a certain percentage of the cases as well. So there was a real hodgepodge of circumstances that we found uh, while I was there that, that sort of helped us, well, sort of scratch our head and try to figure out why is this animal left in this house? What was the owner thinking? Um, and we'll go back and we'll show you some of the more animal rescues. Uh, any other questions from anybody? Can you change that DVD when you get a chance? Yeah. Um, don't but, don't push play. Was there a difference in the survival rate? Like, did the did the dogs that were turned loose at the end have a better survival rate than the dogs that were locked up in the houses? I would say that any animal that was turned loose would definitely have a better survival rate. We did come across many packs of dogs while we were down there um, that were fighting with each other. They were digging through the garbage. Um, and they were, you know, they were they were wild, but they were alive and living and surviving. Um, what you're not going to see in the film tonight is uh, basically what happened was that 
The HSUS, which was the main rescue operation down there, reached its capacity both with animals and with volunteers at a certain point, except hundreds of more volunteers showed up. So what they did is they formed what's called the Win dixie Group. They, they were people that were not um, uh, a part of the HSUS and the, the umbrella organizations, and they formed their own group called the Win dixie They had no training, very little funding, um, but they had a lot of passion and a lot of, uh, a lot of courage and compassion. And so they formed their own group, and they took over a Win dixie parking lot, and uh, the, the, the film takes off comparing them with HSUS and the different uh, rescue styles that they had. So if we were seeing the whole film tonight, we'd start talking about that. Um, but basically, probably around 5,000 people came down from all over the United States uh, to take part in this rescue. And what that tells me is that, you know, natural disasters will happen again, and you guys might be involved in one at some point. Um, and our government will make uh, idiotic policies like that again, regardless of who's president. And these things will happen. They've happened in the past, they'll happen in the future. And what I like about this film is the fact that it shows that Americans will do the right thing. Individual Americans will come out of the woodwork and do the right thing uh, when, when the ships are down. And that's really what this film's about. Yes, ma'am. Well, what could have been done is, at the, let, let's say that your family's being evacuated um, you, let's say the Superdome, you could take your dog down to the Superdome, and as you're getting onto the bus, you could check your dog in at the, you know, with the Humane, the local uh, Louisiana SPCA. They could microchip your pet, you could fill out a few forms, get a barcode, claim check, like when you check your baggage at the airport, get on your bus, be evacuated, and then six weeks later, two months later, whenever, when you return, you go back to the same uh, outfit and you claim your dog. And they can find him easily, they won't have adopted him, they'll have cared for him, and maybe there's a charge for it, maybe there's not. And, and that's a very simple way to do that. It, it costs money and it takes time, but it's, it's something that they could have and should have done, but they didn't. So that's one thing that could have been done. Also, I think people could have been better educated as to what the devastation would have been when the levees broke, and that was an information issue that didn't get out. They did not tell people how bad it was going to be. They didn't tell people that the, when these levees break, their property is going to be flooded and they're not coming back in three days, which is a big difference between other hurricanes and a hurricane hitting New Orleans with levees that are not built to withstand a Category 4, Category 5 hurricane. Yeah, go ahead. Well, microchipping um, is not expensive, uh, Dr. Peterson. I don't know how much microchipping costs. My dog has two of them in there. I, I think I paid about, about $60 to have my dog uh, tagged. So it's really not that large of an expense. And I'm sure that they could probably, in an evacuation situation, they'd probably do it for free. Pretty minor, pretty minor cost. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah, go for it. No, not at all. Not affiliated with any animal rescue group whatsoever. Okay, um, let's we do a little bit more of the film. Okay, the, are we all, all set and ready? Ready? Okay, you want to hit the lights, uh, Dr. Peterson? Um, so we're going to join, uh, what, we're going to skip ahead in the film, about 30 minutes ahead in the film. We're going to join... Um, three rescuers that are at the end of their ropes. They've been working 18-hour days, they've been breaking in houses, they're extremely tired, they've come up against a dead end, they can't figure out a way to get more pets out, the animals have been trapped in the houses for six weeks, many of them are dead or are dying. Um, they uh, can no longer hear them barking, which was the main reason, the main uh, way that they figured out um, how to find the animals. And so we're going to join them at the end of the rescue operation, and then we're going to show you what happened uh, to the pets, the, the reunites, and uh, we're going to go back. Remember that little pit bull Rita, the black and white pit bull Rita that we just rescued with the broken leg? We're going to go back and see what happens to her. So uh, if you want to go ahead and hit play, I think we're ready to roll. Your family pets. Whoops. Because um, most of them were in condition. Did you change the uh, DVD? Mm -hmm. You did. Okay. 
then uh, we have a, um, all right, um, let me see here. Okay, hang on a second. Can we get the lights, please? I thought, I thought my DVD player would remember uh, the queue, but it won't. So just give me a second to change the, to get us where we need to be. Okay, we'll get the lights. Okay, we're ready. Thanks. It's my wife. So, what do you do, man? What do you do? Don't boats work in here or they get stuck? Um, yeah, we got two flat bottoms that me and Ben used. When we were like, no, home. yeah, just throw the crates in the boat and pull the boat, catch the dogs, throw them in the crates in the boat, fill up the boat, and come back. You don't hear them, so well, you can't go bust them. Every, I mean, you know, every door on a block you can't bust it down. That's wasted. To be a waste of time. It's a bad situation, but it's no good thing to do. So you do what you can. Everyone has a breakdown at some point where they just get overwhelmed. The animals are dependent on us. We make them dependent upon us. And then we leave them, we abandon them to fend for themselves. When you're stuck in a house, you're so dependent on humans that you don't have any choices. But people have choices, so I think it's a tendency to vilify the people for the choices that they make. But until you're there in a life-threatening situation, I don't think you can ever say what you would do. But we see the aftermath, we get there later, we don't know what it was like. So I think you have to give the benefit of the doubt. Yeah. My name is Peggy Guiling. I'm from New Orleans, Louisiana. I live in Mid-City. And the Lamar Dixon Center picked up our pet, and I came to get it, and it was here. She was here. And I kept telling the lady, she has sounds like my sweetie. I'm telling you, I know the bark. And sure enough, we got on the end of the lady. goes, look at that. You were right. <laughs> I left on my own um, two days before the storm that Saturday. We went back, you know, just today to check on everything, but we've been gone for a month. And they just got him three days ago, exactly a month later. When you meet people and they're looking for their animal, it puts more humanity into the situation. Y'all just keep your hope up and keep looking. Hey, I finally found her after a month. She made it, and she still has her collar and tags on her. See? Whoop tow, you're gonna be on TV. <laughs> See? <laughs> That's my brother. She's fine. It's sweetie, huh? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm going home and have some tuna. Some tuna, there you go. That's so cute. Thank you. All right, let me, I'm, I'm gonna put you up. He's scared. Okay. All right. Oh. Exporting animals to local humane societies, breed rescue groups, individuals. We even sent 150 animals two nights ago to a, 
Louisiana jail, and the inmates are caring for those animals in what is a tremendously exciting program to help the animals and to help the people as well. Uh, you know, in my population, about 45% of the inmates are from Orleans and Jefferson, which is the next door neighbor to, to Orleans Parish. And so the, their, the impact on their families has been great. And this is a way for them to contribute. I don't think there's any therapy that could be any better than the therapy that they're getting out there right now with, with, with uh, the love that's being shown by those animals towards them. I've been down right now for over 13 years, and I thank God for the opportunity to be here, to share this moment with these dogs. It's beautiful. Due to these dogs, I learned a lot. I learned to understand it. I learned patience, love. These dogs teach us things that we know not what we're being taught all the time. I asked God for patience, but I never knew how it would come. But look at me now, I'm with puppies being out there with the inmates and watching them and seeing a dog just kind of jump on them and lick them and they, they just pet them on the back and the dogs really appreciate it and I know they do too it's just, it's just it's unconditional love doesn't matter who you are or, or where you've been or what you've done that I still love you you know hurt yourself puppy we have pit bulls here we have the dogs that they say that you shouldn't trust, they would attack you, they'll do you any kind of bodily harm, but that's not so. Because if you take time up with a dog, show a dog love, it's like anyone. If you show them love, the anger that they have, love covers a multitude of sins. So the anger that they have, the anger just fades away. It, it has to have a long-term effect on them, a very long-term positive effect on them uh, for when they leave here and, and uh, maybe understand what the world's a little, a bottle, a little better, you know. So. But the love of these dogs is something. This dog, I pray and hope that he be mine one day. I even named him after me. The name my wife gave me, Poppy. This is Poppy. Hey, Poppy. This is the end of uh, a second tour for Oregon Humane Society. The new team that came down to help with the sheltering, and we're happily ending this tour with um, the transport of eight animals, five dogs and three cats, from the Lamar Dixon Expo Center Temporary Animal Shelter back to the Oregon Humane Society of Portland, where they'll be held for the required period of time, and then we'll do our utmost to find great new loving homes for these dogs and cats that have been through so much already. Susan Harden. I'm getting Rita today. She's coming home. She's like, do I really get to go home or is this just an act again? <laughs> There's a lot of treachery out there in the world and if you can make this one little piece a little bit better and if you have the strength and the will to do it, then I think uh, you should. It's really stormy and windy. She gets a little bit uh, afraid. I'm being tied to a rope. She does not like to be tied to a rope. It's very traumatic for her to, to be tied up. Things are 
happening all over the world. The impact of one place definitely spreads its waves. And we need to try to take care of each other.
Okay, guys, thanks. Appreciate it. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, we kind of cut the film in half a little bit. Uh, if you want to see the entire film, I've got copies of the DVD for sale uh, over here, which I'm happy to autograph for you if you wish. Um, but uh, a couple things to share with you. Uh, the Senate just passed their version of the Pet Evacuation Act uh, by a unanimous vote, and Bush is expected to sign the bill. So the, the happy ending to this film is that our government's passed legislation to try to make sure that if there is another pet evacuation in place, uh, that there will be a plan for animals. So that's, that's really good. Um, one other thing, uh, a couple other things I can share with you about the film. Uh, the little dog Poppy that uh, Richard Palmer, the inmate, uh, adopted in the film, uh, his wife just wrote me and said he's going to get out of jail in about a, probably a, about two weeks. And their little dog now weighs 125 pounds. So that dog just exploded. Um, so hopefully that's because he's naturally large and not because they're just feeding him chicken McNuggets or, or you know, whatever. Um, or feeding him nonstop. Why do you eat chicken McNuggets? Is that? A um, couple of the things about the film. Uh, we had a real... Uh, we had a real problem uh, at the Lamar Dixon facility with uh, gang members from New Orleans volunteering uh, to come and, vol and walk the pit bulls uh, while I was there. And there, you missed a whole segment on pit bull fighting, um, but they, we lost over 60 pit bulls uh, to theft during the time that I was there. Uh, another thing that was kind of interesting is the government of Louisiana, other, other than the hurricane, the government of Louisiana was probably the biggest hurdle uh, to the evacuation process. From the police on the street who uh, I show, you don't see in the film, you don't see tonight, but in the film, um, they shot over 24 dogs. Um, they tried to shut down the Lamar Dixon facility. They did shut them down by the end of November. You saw on the, on the um, epilogue, when Dixie was shut down by mid-November, the, the, uh, the government was a real burden. And so the police on the streets were trying to get everybody who was not from New Orleans to leave New Orleans. The Louisiana people wanted to do this themselves. They wanted to sweep most of it under the rug, I believe. Um, but they didn't feel that they needed help from anybody from out of state and that they could do the whole thing themselves. Even though the SPCA, the Louisiana SPC, was totally wiped out by the hurricane and they had no facility. So where they were getting that from, I'm not sure. The uh, Louisiana State Vet at one point um, decided that no animals could be inspected by a vet that was not licensed by the state of Louisiana. And the process to get a license is a week and a half, and a lot of these animals don't have a week and a half. They need to be seen right away. And so that created, um, that created some real hurdles. And the founders of the Winn-Dixie were actually thrown in jail, something that I didn't uh, talk about in the film. And so there, there, we felt a real hostility and a real... Um, uh, unwillingness by the government to, to welcome us there. Uh, when the Humane Society of the United States asked the Louisiana District Attorney to investigate the school, the, do the dogs that were shot at the school, which you didn't see tonight, but it's in the film, instead of investigating it, the DA's office of Louisiana investigated the HSUS instead with some completely trumped up charge of, of some fraud thing that they said that they did, which later was dismissed. So it was, a real, uh, it was a real burden, and it was a very amazing feat that we managed to rescue 10,000 animals out of there. Any questions from anybody? Don't be shy. Go ahead. Sorry how much footage that you have that you didn't use. Uh, we shot around 40 hours of footage, and so the 40 hours gets down to about 75 minutes, uh, which is pretty much par for the course for documentary films. Uh, one of the biggest problems we had in the field, we had to subtitle a lot of people because we didn't have the opportunity to have good mic equipment, good lighting gear. A lot of times we were running through the streets along with the rescuers trying to find the dogs. Um, New Orleans is made up of a lot of corrugated tin, and when the hurricane came through, a lot of the tin was hanging down, and the wind was always blowing because of the, 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 the after winds of the hurricane, and so there was always banging against the, the, the walls all the time. There was just this constant banging. There was helicopters going overhead. There were Humvees driving through the streets. It was a very noisy place. At night, there were generators going. 
And so we had a hard time getting good, clean audio for the film, but you probably don't care about that unless you're a filmmaker. Yeah, go ahead. Well, uh, did I lose a lot of faith in the government? Well, I guess that depends on how much you, faith you have in the government before you go down there. Um, but it was uh, it was pretty sad to see that they did not think about the pets uh, in, in this evacuation process because animals are tied to people. Uh, you know, the, the emotional and uh, physical well-being of people are, are often tied to the relationship they have with their pets. I, for one, would never evacuate without my animal. I wouldn't even think about it. That young woman in the film with the cat, she said that she left two days before the hurricane and her cat was locked in the house for a month. And so my question is, why didn't you take your cat with you if you left on your own two days before the hurricane hit? And it, it brings up a lot of uh, educational issues. You know, if you have pets, get a carrier for them, even if you don't know when you're going to use it. Know how you're going to evacuate. Have a vehicle that's cleaned out enough that you could put your pet in it if you needed to evacuate. And look at your pets as companions. Look at yourself as a guardian. It's not something that you own. It's not a piece of property like a bicycle. It's a, it's, it's, is your companion and you are its guardian. And so that's one of the messages of this film and what I'm trying to get out as I tour across the U.S. and do these screenings. So, anybody else? Well, thank you for coming. I really appreciate it. And uh, again, if you want to ask me some questions, I'm up here at the video table. And if you want to film, they are for sale. Thanks a lot, you guys. It's been a great night tonight. Thank you very much. Yeah, normally if you buy them online, they're thirty dollars. But uh, I'm trying to give the students a break. Okay, there you go. Go find a dog and give it a hug. Say good night, Mallory. Hi there. Hi, Mandy. Used to be next to Kristen's office. Oh, great. Would have gone down with her last fall, but I was pregnant. Yes. This wasn't going to be anybody's home. Right. We're good. Okay, great. Great. Or do you want Inside Iraq or Dark Water Rising? Or I'll tell you what, I'll sell you both of them for. Was she a student discount? No, I'm not a student. Okay. Don't discount me. Okay. I'll sell you both of them. I'll sell you two of them for 30 bucks. Normally they'd be 20 each. That, that's a good This is a good film. This, yeah, is probably, this is probably a, even a more well known film than Dark Water Rising is. It was awesome. Oh, cool. Well, you know, we didn't show any of the good things, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, uh, the I pit bull. Oh, yeah. See you.
from the either the veterinary side or the female side. Who knows? But I thought you did show the best scene. Well, <coughs> all the you know touching, heart, heart rendering. Right. Should I make? Do you have a computer? Uh, Mike oh, Shiley. Okay. Yeah, sell videos, man. Make deals. Get the videos out the door. I don't want to carry them home. I'm going home tomorrow. And where is home? Portland, Oregon. Back to the land of tofu and granola. Yeah. Birkenstocks and pine cones. <laughs> I used to live in Idaho. Oh, there you go. Idaho's a beautiful place. Oh, yeah. What I part of Idaho did you live in? Moscow. Where? Moscow. Oh, yeah, right, sure. I've, I've spoken at uh, uh, Lewis, and Clark, Lewis Clark State College and, and uh, uh, Washington State and had a bunch of Idaho, uh, Idaho kids come over for it. And, um, yeah, it's a nice part of that little three-school area there. It's really beautiful. Yeah, up in the panhandle. Yeah. Yeah, that's nice. Well, thanks for coming to enjoy this. Thanks for speaking to you, that's Oh, that that student uh -huh. thing's great. I'm glad it was well. Well, you get free pizza. We expect. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Thank you very much. So the the Inside Iraq film is uh, very politically balanced. So you'll just get the the straight skinny on what's going on over there without the Rush Limbaugh or the Michael Moore spin job. Okay. okay. At least relatively speaking. Okay. Good. I mean, there's a little spin, of course, but <laughs> there's, gotta be there's gotta be a little spin. Yeah. Great. So thank, thank you very you. much. Yeah, just getting free pizza. <laughs> no, I was going to ask you. Sure, fire away. Who's it that you're working with in, uh, to show this in Des Moines? You. Oh, I thought there was somebody working else. Working with you. I thought there was uh, someone with uh, the, another woman that you had talked to last night that you said that you were trying to set up something at the floor cinema. Yeah, but the floor, like I like I said, they just they just blew me off. So it was it was oh, just they, the floor blew you off. The floor blew me off completely. It was almost like disrespectful to the point. You know, That's like interesting. like I called I called fifteen times for her. I left fifteen messages for her, and I mean I'm not like trying to sell her something. I'm trying to rent her theater. I'm trying to give her money. I'm not asking for money from her, you know. So I was blown away by it. That's interesting. I would have thought that they would have been willing to show it. Which ones do you guys want? I want one of you. Okay, good. Because I don't want to bring them back home. And I don't want to give you change because I don't have it. So okay. you're going to get one of each. And they're really, this one's really good, too. You're going to love them. And I'll autograph both of them. This has been in, in film, festi film festivals all over the world. And uh, is still a huge, huge film in terms of its relevance. It's totally up to date. Everything you see in the film, everything I pitch about in the film, is still relevant and happening. I've re-edited the film five times to keep up with the changing um, um, conditions. So nobody can watch this film and say, "Yeah, but that was three years ago." So, okay, there's one. Yeah, this, this film is, I've shown this film um, 285 times <laughs> all over the U.S. Actually, you know what? I guess I could say 300 because I didn't count the film festival screenings. So, I think I'd go with 300. There you go. And i got two more for you here. Yeah, what you didn't see in this film is pretty gonzo, so fasten your seatbelts. But it's good to start over from the beginning and watch it all the way through. Yeah. Um, I saw it last night and it was told this is interesting to sit here and watch yeah. it. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah, I thought so. I, it's the kind of film that like certain scenes just stick in your head, the music sticks in your head. That Saints, Saints Go Marching In thing. Yeah, I, still, I heard that I was like, wow. I still think about that at night. I was going to ask you um, about if you had any more contact with the two guys that were with the Winn Dixie group, since they both so it sound like they were having a, a depression or post traumatic stress syndrome from being there. If they were doing yeah. better now, or the only thing that Larry said was, he said, "Am I really that much of a redneck?" <laughs> and we said, "Yeah, Larry, you are that much of a redneck." <laughs> And uh, he loves the film. We're going to do a screening in Atlanta, and in defense of animals, we can present him with a Guardian Award, which is pretty cool. Okay, guys. Thanks a lot. Thanks for coming. Yeah, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Well, my next question is, uh, what, what is it that you need to be able to come and give a presentation? Um, 
Well, okay, here's the thing. Here's the pro here's the issue that I'm having. The I've done a bunch of screenings and I've had a really hard time getting here come over here. I've had a really hard time
before we do 50 50 split. So we do a 50-50 split. I'm, I'm thinking since Tom Coleman was here last night, he's the director of the Allen Rescue League, which is a very um, large, uh, pretty, pretty good sized operation in Des Moines. They've been in, in, in operation for a long time. Tom Coleman has done a lot with the group, a lot more. Than you know he was there last night. Yeah, that's what I said. Okay. Since I know he was there last night, I'm not sure if I could arrange like a, a, a something like maybe I'm also now we're trying to get a, a doxing club going in the Des Moines Gulf Central Iowa doxing club. Uh, we're pretty small, um, but that possibly like maybe I could get more than one group to yeah. together. Um, See if you could if you could get a venue. There's another there's another independently owned theater in uh, Des Moines called the Varsity Theater. They also show okay. they're like the original ones that were showing artsy movies. The Floor Cinema, what used to be a regular um, uh, four screen multiplex, yeah, and it was closed for a while. And these people um, reopened it and turned it into an artsy theater, so right. they showed the more independent films. And they did show a film that was produced locally that it still has never made it to the big screen. It was it was just a supposed to be a comedy movie and they let him they showed it for him and then they were selling um his he was selling his dvds afterwards so that's why i was surprised that they um, didn't um, work with the as well Okay, maybe something. 